Madam Chair, if I can get it. Uh -huh. Okay, let me mute this over here. Where are you at in the phase?
So you want me to talk right next to you? Good afternoon. Good to see all of you here on this beautiful day. Uh, I'm in charge. I'm Pastor Sharon Brown. I'm the pastor here. I'm in charge of housekeeping rules, etc. Um, Robert's rules, all that stuff. So, um, first of all, it would be great if you have cell phones with you. 
if you put them on silent. Very helpful. Um, also, for those of you who are attending via YouTube, if you can uh, comment with your first name and where you're signing in from, um, then we can have an idea of how many real attendees we have. And also, you, that is a way to do Q&A during the Q&A time. Uh, just type a comment. Um, and of note, if you do not have a Google account, you won't be able to contact comment. So that's, we recommended that when we sent out the link. Um, I think that's it. And you're going to introduce Michael. So um, let us pray. Gracious God, Jesus turned water into wine so that the party could keep on going. Um, we thank you for the many and various ways that we can enjoy your good creation in moderation. We ask that you be with us now and that we take away something from this gathering that we didn't know before. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Sharon, and welcome everybody to our third presentation of our 2023 Religion and Science Lecture Series, sponsored by Spirit of Joy Lutheran Church in Clarkdale, Arizona. Uh, we're glad that you're all here. We hope that you all find the se this series, this lecture, both informative and thought-provoking. The series is part of the Clergy Letter um, Project, an association of religious leaders and scientists who believe that there is no necessary conflict between science and religion. Today we bring together both religion and science. The Bible makes numerous references uh, to wine in both the Old and the New Testament. And in fact, as Sharon uh, had stated, Jesus performed his first miracle um, at a wedding feast in Cana by turning water into wine. Our speaker today is Michael Pierce. He is the director of the Viticulture and Enology Center at the Camp Verde campus of Yavapai College. Michael won't be replicating that miracle, but he will be offering us a brief overview of the science of winemaking with a focus on what makes the Verde Valley so special for growing, harvesting, and creating their award-winning wines. Michael's a native of Arizona. Um, he instructs at the winemaking course, instructs the winemaking courses at the Applewhite College, and oversees the operations of the Southwest Wine Center. It's an on-campus teaching vineyard, a winery, and a tasting room. And if you have not had the chance to go out and have some of their wines, you're missing out. So, um, Michael also um, serves as the winemaker for the Bodega Pierce, uh, a family wine brand that he runs in conjunction with his parents. The Pierce family farms 32 acres of grapes at their vineyard in Wilcox, Arizona, which is also another place to go and visit. So please give me a big round of applause and welcome Michael. try this and move around a little bit. It makes me more comfortable. So let me know if you can't hear me. Um, thank you for the introduction. I think you know who I am now. My name is Michael. It's nice to see you all. Um, my wife Marnie's here. We live just down the road, so you might see us walking the dog or riding the bike. So we're locals, and it's a quick little walk right up to the work, which I'm happy to be here and right next to everything. So that's a picture of our campus vineyard. If you haven't been to it yet, Take Black Hills Drive all the way up to the top, and curves around to the left, and the college has 12 acres up there. Yeah. There's another one acre just on the actual campus. Uh, January 23rd, and I'm sorry, this is um, so small, so I'll read some of the more important points. January 23rd, four inches of snow. Um, a couple days later, clouds cleared out, gets real cold, um, 22 degrees. Um, and I, I give you that, those details because I think it tells the story of what our grades go through. 
and where we get the kind of character from the wine um, because of the climate that you know they have to um, produce grapes through. And this is not hurt the grapes. Um, they might look like they're dead, but they're not. They're asleep. They're completely dormant. Um, we are in the process right now of going through and doing the pruning. So we cut off all of uh, the growth from last year with the exception of two little buds. And we're very particular about what we leave behind because from what we leave behind, we get our brand new growth. Um, and you'll see a little bit more in the presentation here on your life cycle. Here's what I think of the vineyard. This is what I think of. Um, huge green canopies. Uh, Memphis harvesting of grapes August 6th. Um, on that day, the high temperature was 96 degrees. Now, that's not at 96 degrees. We, we pick, start picking grapes at 5 a.m. So we're done by about 8 a.m. because we're trying to get the grapes off absolutely as cool as possible. As soon as we pick them, they're going to want to start fermenting naturally. So we, we want to control that as winemakers. Um, we do community uh, events where people come out and help pick the grapes. Has anybody been there? Help pick? I see no. Okay, well, maybe after this I can you know, get some new volunteers. Uh, it's, it's a fun community event. Um, there's nothing to know. We, we will help you with that. There's nothing to bring other than a hat and maybe a water bottle. Um, we had about 52 tons of grapes come off that field, so it takes a lot of work. And it's all done by hand, um, uh, but there's a lot of people out there that care a lot about the vineyard, and you see it in the quality that we get because of the hard work they put in. Um, I was asked just earlier ago about Wilcox. Sorry, I think he was mentioning Wilcox. Um, Wilcox is this, uh, excuse me, it's all the way down to the right. You see the Wilcox ABA. ABA is American Viticultural Area. So that is a um, distinguishingly different place where they grow grapes. And Arizona has three of them. I'm going to kind of talk through each of them. Believe it or not, all the way down there near Mexico, those, both of those two regions are higher and colder than we are here in kind of the geographic center of Arizona. Um, and that's just a, a, a factor of elevation creating those cool temperatures down there. So their grapes are going to be different than our grapes up here because they go through different temperatures, different, climb, uh, different weather patterns, and so on. A uh, little history. Uh, Dr. Gordon Dutt, he needs to be mentioned. He actually just passed uh, about six months ago. Um, you were a soil scientist in the 1970s, and he is really the, the kind of father of uh, the modern Arizona wine uh, industry. At the time, in the 70s, Arizona wine was not a concept. Uh, he was working with table grapes, table grape farmers in Yuma, trying to uh, help them with some soil issues because he was a soil scientist. And he wanted to study wine grapes. So he got a grant from the Four Corners Commission to try and study wine grapes here in Arizona um, to see if it was a viable crop. Um, he actually planted, uh, anybody from Tucson? Familiar with Tucson? Yeah, we got a yes. Uh, Campbell, Campbell Avenue, there's a Campbell farm right in the middle of Tucson. He planted in the middle of Tucson, Arizona. Nowadays, we think, gosh, that's not gonna work. Well, when you don't have a frame of reference, you gotta try somewhere. So um, what he learned there was he needed acidic soil and he needed higher elevation. It was too hot, and he also had a, a, an issue called Texas root rot because his soil was too basic. So from that, he moved to Sonoida, which is where that Sonoida ADA was established. Um, not too many years after that, this guy, uh, Robert Webb, started planting in the Wilcox region. And that was about uh, 1983. Um, at the time, nothing was really happening here in the Verde Valley. So really, southern Arizona started long before the Verde Valley as a wine growing region. Um, maybe just one more piece here. Um, what he planted, Cabernet Sauvignon, Petit Straw, French Columbard, it was what was popular at the time. They didn't have that frame of reference that we, we do have now, and also the college is kind of, uh, trying to help new growers understand what's going to do well um, here in Arizona. So he planted what was doing well in California, and I think he learned some important lessons that um, we're able to, to um, use now. So those are the uh, two ABAs down there. To the right of that line is uh, New Mexico. To the south is Mexico. That's how far down it is. Um, you might be able to see that kind of uh, real tan shape there in the middle of Wilcox. That's the Wilcox Playa. 
around that basin, there's a lot of agriculture. There's big pivot farms. So that's where they grow corn, alfalfa, some of the more commodity crops. There's also tree nuts down there, apples. Um, that agricultural industry helps the wine industry down there because that means now we have well drillers and we've got tractor you know, uh, maintenance and uh, all of the pesticides that we might need to, to grow grapes. Um, two thirds of the wine grapes in Arizona come from this region. Now, two thirds of the wine is made right here in the Verde Valley. And I'll tell you a little bit about that and why that's the case in a minute. Um, if you've been around the wine industry here, anybody heard of Henry Sherman? I see, see a yes there. Um, this is the very first commercial wine grower that at least history remembers. Um, a German immigrant. Um, you can hardly see it. That picture to the top left, that's Cathedral Rock behind his farm. You know, just imagine what that property value is now. And he was growing 76 acres of grapes at the time because you know, his cultural history was grape growing. It was just part of his, you know, his life. So um, he was selling it um, all around the Verde Valley, uh, selling it up to the mines in Jerome. Well, Arizona Prohibition came in before National Prohibition, and he was shut down. Um, there are folks who have been able to find uh, the site and actually found some grapes that were still growing there. They're trying to propagate and bring that vineyard back to life. It is thought that they were sent to death. Um, 76 acres, that's a heck of a lot. That's a, that's a lot for nowadays. And he was doing this uh, 18, uh, 1880s. Um, uh, so Yavapai County. When did, it, did we, when did we start around here? Echo Canyon was the first one kind of in what is now the Verde Valley ADA, and that was at the top of Page Springs Road. Some people might know where John McCain and his family have a property, very close to there. That was not until 1997, so the folks down in Sonoida and Wilcox, they were a good 20 years prior to the Verde Valley. Um, what more to say about that? Um, Echo Canyon made some really great wines. Um, actually, one of my graduates now owns that property, and they are um, kind of revitalizing it. So here we are, Verde Valley ADA. It took us a little while uh, to get there. Uh, established officially in 2021. So it took us 20 years of growing grapes before we were able to say to the federal government, we want to acknowledge this place is special. Um, the, the real purpose of doing that and establishing an ADA is to market. Market Verde Valley as, an, as a destination, come here, the wines are unique. Um, even though Verde Valley was, was a, a term that we coined and, and used, we had to actually determine where the boundary was. That was something that was never actually defined. So um, I got to be a part of that process, and we petitioned to the um, U.S. Treasury to establish the Verde Valley ADA, and it took us a few years. Um, during that process, at the bottom it says 2016 Vineyard Survey. We had 43 different varieties growing around here, about 125 acres. So certainly, uh, we have quite a few more than that, but uh, to give you just a, a comparison, uh, Wilcox has about 1,500 acres. We may have about 150 here in the Verde Valley. So what makes it special? Why are we here? Um, you see a relief map. Notice how it, within the ADA, which is within that yellow line there, the color is so much lighter. Well, that's lower elevation. And above it, and you got the Mogollon Rim there. To the west, you got Vegas Mountain. Well, those big changes in elevation create big temperature swings. That's what the uh, diurnal temperature swing there, about 25 to 30 degrees. So if you're out hiking in the summer, and it's hot, and that sun starts to go down, you know that it's going to get cool real quick. That helps us with our grapes. So what that does to the grapes is it helps hardy the skins, actually creates more color, more phenolics, just more aroma compounds. And so without those, that big temperature swing, we're not going to get, we have a lot of sugar, but we're not going to have the character that we need. Um, what else is in the middle of that yellow line? Water. Water. That's a, <laughs> right down the middle. Verde Valley, Oak Creek. So we've got the right climate, and we've got water. We're going to need one more piece. Soil. Soil. We've got the right type of soil. Uh, we've got loamy soils here. 
So most of the soils throughout the Verde Valley are alluvial, meaning they've been de deposited over many, many years from uh, water, water moving. Uh, loamy soils are, are a mix of sand, silt, and clay. Um, there's varying soil types depending on exactly where you're at. Even within our, our vineyard here at the college, we've got real clay-rich soils, very sandy soils, but in general, they're a nice, um, coarse mix of soil. That means they like to percolate the, the water. Grapes don't like to have wet feet. So what that means is you don't, you don't want it soggy. Even though they need water to grow, they need good draining soil. So we have that. Um, one other piece of info up there that I think is worth noting. Uh, the YC vineyard, we use reclaimed water. So if you just head down to Verde Valley School, no, uh, what's the school? Uh, Drone, Old Drone Highway. I used to live in Village Oak Creek, that's where that came about. Um, Old Drone Highway, it'll dead end right next to the Cottonwood reclaimed plant. We use that same water uh, at, up at the College Vineyard, which is great because the, the city of Cottonwood's literally just broadcasting it out to, to try and recharge the aquifer. Uh, how much water we use is 1.3 acre feet per acre per year. So an acre foot, think of an acre, a foot deep, that's an acre foot. Uh, agriculture uses that volume of water to as a unit. So an acre foot is a unit. Uh, alfalfa uh, is about four to six acre feet per acre per year. And we're at about 1.3. So uh, almost a quarter of that. And also, we're, we're what's called a specialty crop. So we're growing on small acreage and high density. Where alfalfa, they might need 120 acres for it to be a viable crop. Um, from 10 acres, you can um, you know, have a, a, a business. A little bit more on viticulture, and then we'll move into winemaking. Uh, broadly speaking, if you look at the latitude across the globe, between 50, north, 50 and 30 north is kind of the sweet zone. 50 and 30 south is a sweet zone, all the way around the globe, both southern and northern hemispheres. Uh, Verde Valley is right about 34 degrees north. Wilcox is 32 degrees north. So we're on the southern end of that. However, what we have is those high temperatures, excuse me, the high elevation to give us the low temperatures at night. So we're within that zone, we're within that band. And if you follow uh, the latitude around, we're kind of equal with southern Italy, the really tip of southern Spain. Now, they don't have the same elevation we have, but they do have the Mediterranean, which provides that same kind of cooling effect at night. Um, so those are the so sort of varieties that do well for us. Um, at the college, we have a lot of Italian varieties uh, and a few Spanish. Here's why I like to uh, be an instructor on wine. And also, here's, here's something I... Um, the dean who helped put this program in place um, used this, this concept to, to sell the idea to the upper administration was that don't think of, hey, the students are gonna be making wine. Because that doesn't tell the whole picture. They're gonna be making wine, but it's also going to lead to economic development. They're gonna go start businesses. It's gonna lead to tourism. It's gonna lead to new restaurants, so on. He was exactly right. So already we've been talking uh, 20 minutes or so um, we've talked about the value-added crop, uh, we talked about low water use, we've talked about jobs, we've talked about agriculture, we've talked about specialty crop. So wine is not any one thing. We've got all sorts of different um, professional backgrounds that you can kind of rely on to, to make your way in the wine world. Um, here's some more old data, um, and I really wish you guys could see some of these things. So any of you in 2017, did an economic impact study. Um, that's already out of date, six years now. Uh, they're actually redoing it right now. So if you go and uh, visit any of the tasting rooms around here, they might ask you to participate in a survey. Uh, please do so. Uh, it, it's anonymous. What they're looking to do is see where everybody's coming from, uh, what their backgrounds are, what sort of economic impact that the industry has, because this sort of data helps us tell our story. So at that time, uh, 56 million in economic output, 640 full-time jobs, uh, about 600,000 visitors uh, annually. So I anticipate those numbers to go up quite a bit here once the 2023 numbers come in. Um, from that study, 
we were able to take um, those numbers to the state legislature and say, pay attention to what's going on. Something's happening here in Arizona, it's an Arizona line. Um, they, uh, it was Senator Gail Griffin, she's from Cochise County. She earmarked $100,000 to promote Arizona wine and had the Arizona Office of Tourism kind of shepherd those, those funds through. Um, and for a few years they were doing that and they were helping to get the word out and do online ad advertising and create rack cards. Well, it was last year, that number bumped up to a million bucks. So from the, that million dollars, they have uh, an app that you can get. Um, there's a number of different ways they're helping support and provide grants back to businesses. Um, so we're really thankful for, for that kind of support. Um, and the reason why the state um, sees value in, in supporting the Arizona wine industry is it's going to be new tax revenue, sales tax revenue, but also 84 cents of every single gallon of wine that's produced in Arizona, there's a tax paid right back to the general fund. Okay, uh, enough on that, let's talk about some winemaking. So a ton of grapes, what can a ton of grapes do? Uh, a ton, I'm talking about 2,000 pounds. Uh, that picture you see on the bottom left, that's a half ton, just to visualize it. And that bin is about, um, think of like one of those wooden pallets they ship things around. It's that footprint, and it's about 30 inches tall, full, that's a half ton. From there, you get about 160 gallons of juice. Um, it works out to about 60, uh, 60 cases. So think of a case box, you get 60 cases. Now that ton of grapes, if you were a grape farmer, you could sell for about $2,500 a ton. That number keeps going up. Now if you were to take that ton of grapes, turn it into wine, depending on your price of wine and what it is, um, you could get a return of about 10,000 to 15,000. So quite a bit more, just from that one ton of grapes. Now there's more out, you know, outlay to get it from the grape phase into the wine phase, but average yield, uh, about a ton and a half to four tons per acre. So this is why one acre can generate quite a lot more revenue than you know, some of the commodity crops. And not, not only are we not a commodity crop, but there's a value added that it comes from this place. So when we're selling that bottle of wine, we say it's from the Virgin Valley, come here and visit, um, go to Old Town, go hiking, you know, tell the whole story. Viticulture, that's one half of our program. So Vitus is the genus of a plant that we study. Culture means growing. Uh, we use Vitus vinifera, which is the European wine grape. So some of the varieties you're, you're maybe heard of before, like uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, um, Sangiovese, uh, Viognier. There is grapevines that are native here to Arizona. If any of you have been down to the jail trail, you walk down that hill going towards the river, Look up into the trees, right now they'd be hard spots, there's no leaves, but um, during the summer, look up in the trees, you'll see something called Vitus Arizonica, it's a native grape to Arizona. Uh, those do not produce the same sort of uh, grapes that we use for wine, so we use the same things that uh, people over centuries have hybridized and created, you know, flavorful whole wine. But it's an effort. There's over 5,000 different varieties. It is a deciduous plant. That means it loses its leaves, goes woody, and that's the stage we're in. However, it comes back to life every year. If you treat them well, you should be able to get 25 to 30 years out of them, just depending on uh, where you're growing. Um, up top there, you see a little, what we call a spur, about two inches tall. That's what we cut them all the way back to, believe it or not. From that little spur, we're going to get that great big canopy. Um, if we did not prune it back, it would overbear and it would just be a great big bush and we would not get the quality we need. Um, right about our spring break, between the middle of March to the end of April, it's going to look like that second picture there. It's going to start to have some green growth. As soon as it does that, we're on frost watch. So that's when we can no longer get frozen temperatures. Um, it is a dicot, which means there's multiple leaves within that one bud. There's, in fact, there's three. So in that tiny little bud, three leaves come unfolding out. Um, that happens when the average daily temperature is about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Let me show you some unfortunate pictures here. Um, the, the left, this was uh, April 14th. This is last spring season. This was the first spring frost we've ever had at the college day. Um, my parents have been here in Wilcox, unfortunately. This happens quite a bit more, and that's because they're about, um, let me do the math here, about 600 feet higher in elevation. So you see that's plant material here on the left that is it's no good. It's, it's fried from, from frost. Look at the top right, and on that same vine, you've got growth that is just fine, and it's limber, and it's going to do just fine, and then two spur positions down, and it's fried. You, we could actually see the, the cold kind of going through the vineyard like a wave. Um, and then you see that same growing season in the same block from the tractor. It does all come back. Um, with that one bud, it puts out a shoot. Now, if that shoot gets frosted, there's another shoot. However, that second shoot's going to have half the fruit. So if you get frosted, immediately your, your fruit yield goes from 100% down to 50%. If you get frosted again, there's a third bud there. However, that's just vegetative growth. So then you, you've got leaves. Um, so the vine, the, that block did come back, and this only happened in kind of one and a half blocks. But um, people think Arizona is too hot for wine grapes, and the story is always it's actually can be too cold. So we'll see. It's been cold this winter. I'm going to be curious to see how the spring plays out because we're just about a month away from that. From that period, so we get our shoot growth into March, first part of April. We will then go through these next four phases over the next uh, right about four months. Uh, and thesis is flowering, so grapes are self-pollinating. They've got both pieces there. Um, you don't want to be in there working when the flowers are there because the flowers are delicate. Each individual grape berry actually gets pollinated. Then at, then at that point, we have what's called fruit set. And you've got these little hard green high acid things there. Um, that's the time when we can get in there and actually work with the canopy, make sure there's not cluster on cluster, you know, do some shoot thing. Once we hit the next phase, you see there's some color developing there. Uh, Verasian, that means we have sugars. Uh, for the green, for the white wines, they go from that hard green and they start to yellow. That means you've got Verasian. And for, for the reds, it's pretty obvious. We got it looks like a party balloons there, all sorts of different colors. At that point, we can't go in there and uh, work with clusters because we don't want the clusters to break. And then they go through adjustment where they fill, fill with sugar and water, and uh, eventually we'll pick them. Uh, I won't go uh, into this too much. Um, I'll leave it at, if you want to have some further conversations on what's happening within the grapevine, that's what the program's all about. Um, and we talk about the science of the biology of what the plant is doing. So the leaves are actually creating the acids. Photosynthesis helps create the, the carbohydrates. The vines use that in different ways. You know, they create leaves and be happy grapevines. When there's extra carbohydrates, they can store that either in the clusters or in their roots. Um, to put a broad point on it, as grapes ripen, the, the sugar goes up, more sugar, and the acid goes down. Well, we need to have the correct amount of that. We don't just want sugar, we also want acid. So that's why as things are ripening, we're watching both of those parameters before we say, okay, it's today's pick day. Um, that pie chart, uh, the blue, this is the composition at harvest. That blue is how much water is in grapes. That orange is how much sugar is in grapes. Um, and it depends on when we choose to pick it, how much sugar is there. But uh, in general, wine grapes are very, very sweet. Noticeably very, very sweet. So the grapes that you buy at the store to have um, for lunch are about 10 to 12% sugar. Wine grapes are easily double that. Um, and part of that is because they're so small. You know, wine grapes are, or excuse me, table grapes are, are pretty big. Uh, wine grapes are like little blueberries, so they're, they're compact. Uh, we need those amounts of, that high amount of sugar because we need to ferment that sugar to have a stable product because we, the, from the sugar comes the alcohol. Then we pick them. They go into the big bins. Um, the students there on the top left, they are cluster sorting. So we want to make sure only the best grapes go right into our fermenter. Um, there's a picture down there with blue bins, and what that picture shows is no available floor space. Uh, 
Um, so you, you <laughs> what I'm trying to say is it gets busy during harvest. Um, you pick four, four tons of grapes uh, in the morning from 5 a.m. to 8 a.m. and you feel really good about it. You got four tons of grapes picked. Well, now you got to do something with four tons of grapes that, that morning. And you have to have a place for them to go. Depending on how our harvest season goes, the seller can get really busy. So if we have time, we can... Um, uh, well, uh, let me describe this another way. 2019-2020, um, you guys remember the monsoons we had? What do you remember about them? 2019-2020. Nonsense. No monsoons. Hot. Hot and dry. Well, our harvest period is August, right when it's hot and dry, and the sugars are going straight up, and we're trying to watch those sugars. We don't want them to go too high, and we don't have any break from the weather, so we had to pick all those 50 tons basically came in within about four weeks. So there was no room whatsoever. We had to process them right away. What do we remember from last harvest, last monsoon season? Nobody's backyards flooded out? <laughs> I think if you remember, we had a lot of rain. And we had, so we had these periods where we would pick, and then it would be a week of, it's a mud bog in the vineyard. You know, we got to let the vineyard dry out but it also put some relief on the winery that they could handle what was already in the house. Um, so as the harvest plays out, um, you know, so does the winemaker's sleep schedule, I guess. Uh, enology, so these are the classes I teach. Uh, enos is the Greek word for wine, logos is study, so the study of wine. Um, what is it? What, what is wine? What is the Greek word? Enos. Yeah, enos. Um, they, they, they spell it O E N O S. O E N O S. Um, it, most of the spellings in the United States, they just drop the O because it doesn't really roll off the tongue the same way. Um, so it's not oncology, it's enology. It's study of wine grapes. Um, you probably assumed when you heard this was about winemaking that we were going to be talking about grapes. Grape wine. Well, has anybody had a wine other than grape wine? What you have? Elderberry. Elderberry. Um, I have a wonderful old book of someone who liked to um, gather, it's called A Natural Year, and her grandfather made wine out of carrots and dandelions and yeah, everything. Mm. Everything. Anybody else? Apple. Apple, yeah. Apple. Yeah. Blue garden. Uh, me, yeah. Yeah, we make some of that at the wine center if you want to come try it over. Papaya? Papaya? Really? Wow. Yeah. I don't drink a lot of it, but the rice wine. Sake. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Choke cherries. Oh, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Wall liquor. Yeah. Cranberry. Cranberry. Yeah. What, you, what have you got? Honey. Honey, yeah, me. Yeah. Uh, so honey naturally has a lot of sugar. It has everything. If anything, honey, you've got to kind of water it back. Some of those other ones, like the choke cherry and the elderberry and the dandelion, uh, you can make wine out of all of those. You can make wine out of anything that has any sort of sugar. However, we need to make a stable wine, and we need, we need to make a wine that is fit for human consumption. Um, wine, uh, excuse me, wine grapes has everything they need. They have natural amount of sugars. So that 25% sugar that I was showing you, the, the grapes produce that on their own. There's few fruits that actually are able to ripen that much. Um, dates are an example that a fruit that can create that much sugar naturally. Um, you need a low enough pH. Uh, grapes have high enough acid, which creates a low enough pH, and then they have something called phenolics, which helps buffer the oxygen. All of that is naturally present. So that means we can, if we can grow healthy wine grapes, we can pick that, and all of the chemistry that is in those grapes is what's going to be the chemistry in the bottle. Some of those other wines that we make, um, we have to augment. So if we want to make a, a carrot wine, we would certainly need to put some form of sugar in there table sugar, whatever it may be. Um, wine grapes, it, it almost seems as if it was meant to be a thing because naturally it has it all there. In addition to having all of those chemical um, constituents to it, it also has yeast on the outside. So if you take those grapes, grow them as they naturally grow and, and crush them, you're going to have wine. Um, <clears throat> let's talk about the production. Uh, white wines come from white grapes. So they're not really white grapes, really. They're kind of green grapes, but that's how you get your white wines. Rosés typically come from red grapes. 
And then red wines come from red grapes. Of course, there's exceptions throughout all of them. Um, now, the whites and the rosés, they get pressed before fermentation. What that means is we take the fruit, goes to the press, and we get the juice into some tank, into a barrel, somewhere else, and then we ferment just the juice. The reds get pressed after fermentation, so we take those red grapes and we ferment the actual berries to extract the color and the phenolics, and then after that, we press them. Um, here's what the white wine making process would look like. So that those grapes go to some form of a press. Um, that first tank in the, in the way, in the pathway, is just a settling tank. So think about making fresh juice at home, your orange juice or whatever. It's going to be pulpy. It's going to be high solid. Grapes and grapes are no different. We don't want to ferment that because we, it'll have kind of a musty high solid character. So we want a day or two of letting those solids just settle out. And then we do what's called racking. We take the clean stuff off the top. So we take that clean stuff, go to another vessel, and then we ferment. From there, we could essentially bottle with white wines. There's not, there's not another step after that. Um, you see the picture on the left, those folks are sorting out material other than grapes. So leaves, fuzz, anything else you don't want in your wine. Uh, the red wine's a little bit different. There's a couple more steps in here. We take those high solid um, clusters, we have to process them, and then we've got a big bin of real heavy, um, just red grape berries. We ferment that, and we have to do punch downs. The, the berries like to float up, so we have to punch them back down. Then we've got to press them, and then reds go through a secondary fermentation, which is an acid fermentation, converting malic acid to citric acid, so they have that nice broad palate that most red wines have. Well, then red wines also have tannins because we fermented them on the skins. And what tannins are, if you've ever um, had a wine that very, makes your mouth feel very dry. Um, another way that you might have uh, experienced this, if you've had an underripe banana. Think of like a green banana and you bite it. It has this chalkiness to it, but it makes your mouth kind of puckered. That's just that's a tannin that bananas have. Um, we, you, don't, you don't really enjoy a red wine that has too much of that. You know, most, most people want something a little bit more smoother and it's easy to drink. Well, it just takes time. That's where the barrels come in. So the barrels help facilitate that process. Uh, might be 12 months, might be 18 months, but it, it's going to take some time. So it's usually advisable if you're starting a brand new wine business, um, come out with a white wine first. You know, because then in six months' time, you could ha have a product there to sell. Um, if you're going to buy $2,500 worth of grapes, sit on it for two years, and then go out to market, you know, I mean, that's just a long time before you start building your brand. And we go through all of that in, in our program as well. Uh, how wine is regulated? Uh, we can't just, you can't make it at home, you can make it up on a small scale at home. Anything you make at home, you can share with your friends, have your friends over for dinner, you cannot sell it. As soon as alcohol is produced, it's now considered a drug. Uh, on the federal level, it's the TTB that oversees that. So at the Southwest Wine Center, we have a basic permit for the Tax and uh, Trade Bureau. These guys are the tax collectors. So um, they're not a, uh, they're within the U U.S. Treasury, they're not within the U.S., um, what am I trying to think of? USDA. Not USDA, we have to abide by the USDA, uh, the cops. Um, <laughs> um, I'll, I'll think about it. Alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. So the alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, which is the Department of Justice, I knew it would come, uh, that's what happens when you're doing something illegal. The Department of Justice. Um, you should not be dealing with the Department of Justice. You should, on a daily basis, be dealing with the TTB. So they do all of our reporting. We tell them, here's how many gallons are on the site. Uh, we have to get our labels approved. We send them to them. We pay all of our taxes to them. So they're kind of just a regulatory oversight um, federal, federal agency. The state is the Liquor License and Control. We have to get a license from them. Well, they get to uh, oversee our production our sales and our distribution. So our sales at our tasting room and when we go to distribute to another retailer. Um, so it gets a little complicated. You have to make sure you know the rules. Um, definitely pay your taxes. Um, yeah, that's just an analogy for... Uh, uh, here's what we can do with the farm winery license. So this is the state license. Um, I'll just read it. It's, yeah, you can't see that one. Um, we can produce, we can uh, distribute, and we can sell. 
That's pretty nice. Not all states have that. So we are what's called a three-tiered state, and those are the three tiers. Production of alcohol, distribution of alcohol, and then the retail sales. So with our license type, we can do all of those things. In some states, you're in, you're in one of them. So you're a producer, and then you sell it to a distributor. Or you're a distributor who can't produce and can't be a retailer. Um, so it is nice that we can do that in Arizona. Um, here's what the licenses look like. Um, over the last 10 years, wineries have gone from 36 to 124. In that time, they've added something called a remote tasting room license. Um, so for example, actually out this window, you can probably see my winery. Uh, we have a winery license down there. My parents are down at the vineyard where we also have a tasting room. That's a tasting room license. Um, so it's, it's the same business with two license sites, but they can't produce down there, but they can sell. So that's, um, that's why sometimes you'll see the same brand at different places. It doesn't necessarily mean they're a winery. So together, that's 169 licenses, which is quite a bit of growth from 36, 10 years ago. So at the college, um, first year is viticulture. So you come work with the earth, um, take soils classes, water classes, all of the viticulture classes. There's also practicums where you work in that 12 acre vineyard. And then the second year is the enology program where you're in the cellar. Uh, we talk about the winemaking and the chemistry of it. Uh, in that program, we also get into the compliance piece and the business piece. And then if you get your general ed classes, so your math, English, and science, that's where you get your AAS. So we have a two year associate's degree and we also have a one year certificate program. Uh, it was established in 2009, that's when classes were first offered. Uh, the building itself was constructed in 2014. Uh, it was an old racquetball court. Um, and it's a beautiful repurposing. Some of you, I'm sure, remember the days of the racquetball court. Um, it's a low impact building, so they put in a lot of touches to make sure they were able to reuse absolutely as much of it. Um, good storage of, of the cold temperature. Um, students have everything they need up there. Average age, 48 and a half. So you see the pictures there. Um, they're adults that do other things in life. They have families, they have careers, and they're working on maybe their next project or maybe just some personal interest classes. Um, we have won some awards. So students are very proud of how well they've done. Um, won Best in Show at the Arizona Republic competition a couple years ago, uh, San Francisco Chronicle, and Jefferson Cup. So good job to them. Uh, I'm asked about this a lot. Um, see all those logos up this, this is up there. That's where you'll find our students. So all the big logos are places, are businesses that have been started by our graduates. Those smaller logos there on the, on the bottom right, those are established businesses um, who also employ our students. So there's more to add to this, uh, but those are some of, um, some of the first ones that came to mind. So they're all over the place. Um, it's gotten to the point now where any industry um, gathering is kind of a, an alumni gathering for us, too. So we're proud of that. Um, Harvest at YC, I mentioned that to you before. If you're interested in coming up for a morning just to see what it's like, watch the sunrise from the vineyard, pick some grapes, um, we will be up there. Uh, I can give you my card and you can get you on the email list. We do have a fundraiser October 21st. Coming up, it's at the Wine Center. We have restaurants come out. Um, somewhere around 20 or so other wineries will be there. It's our big fundraiser for the year. Um, yeah, if you guys want to go try wine, they're open until 6 p.m. tonight. <laughs> I think this is the last time. That we're doing okay. Um, yeah, the taste room's open Thursday to Sunday. Uh, I do recommend making reservations. Since it was a racquetball court, you can envision how big the taste room is because it's one of those courts. It's not humongous. Um, if you make a reservation, you will have a place for yourself and those folks you come with. Um, when we get full, we kind of move out to the outside, which is very nice, but make a reservation. Yeah. Okay, I think that's what I had. Okay, thank you, Michael.
microphone, so if you have a question, everybody else can hear it. Tell me what the AA degree is. Uh, uh, associates in uh, Associates of Arts. Arts, oh, okay. Yeah, Arts is actually an AAS, Associates of Applied Science. Okay. One of the award things was for Corvette. Mm -hmm. Where is that going? Uh, well, well, actually, probably in all three of the regions. Wow. Yeah, my family vineyard has it. My favorite. That's a good one. Yeah, it's a Spanish variety. Little anecdote. Mm -hmm. My husband and I lived in the Phoenix area. We belonged to a beer and wine making group down there. And one of our field trips was through U of A to their viticulture program. We met Dr. Betts. We told him that we were we had an option on an acreage in the Purdue Valley. We were interested in growing grapes, and he said, "Poor area." <laughs> you mentioned uh, going around Wilcox; they have a lot of farming, and. Herbicides, in particular, in, in my experience, don't mix very good with grapevines. So is that a problem? Oh yeah, they don't mix whatsoever with grapevines. Yeah, they have to be completely separate. Um, uh, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so I, I can tell you my personal experience and what we have tried to do. We've tried to mechanize our weed abatement. A weed is just a, a plant that is out of place. So we do not want any plants that are in there that compete with our grapevines, so we've got to take them out. Where we get those weeds is right where the water is, which is right underneath our trellis where the vines are. So what we have uh, adopted here at the college is we have an under the vine tiller. It's a, it's a side mounted uh, implement that actually is able to cultivate underneath the vines. So we're able to mechanize the weeding underneath the vines. Um, and the best approach we've been able to come up with for the row, uh, so right in the middle between the vines, is mowing. And this has been hugely helpful for us, because we're on a slope, which you want for good airflow, and we were having terrible soil erosion. And as soon as we started to mow, instead of having weeds, we had grasses, so the native grasses would establish themselves, and it would help kind of bring in more organic material into the soil, and it would help with that erosion issue. So I think vineyards are taking different approaches to, to making sure that the, any sort of herbicide use is you know, as minimal as possible. What kind of... Um, what kind I, of I think there was one more question. Well, I was just going to mention uh, Wilcox was where I found the best wine that fit my palate in the whole state of Arizona. <laughs> What kind of uh, insect or animal pest do you have to deal with? Um, well, all of the animals want the grapes because they're full of sugar, you know, which is carbohydrates and quick energy for them. So we have 10 foot deer fencing, so we try and keep the big animals out. Um, insects, uh, there's something called a grape leaf skeletonizer, which affects us kind of right after harvest period, eats the, the, the leaves and it turns into just the skeleton of the leaf. Um, we're able to handle that with actually a pretty easy um, organic application of Bt. Um, green hornworms that you get on your tomatoes, we get those. Uh, we get something called spittle bug, which affects the middle of the cluster. Um, all sorts of things. I could go on and on. Um, uh, sharpshooters bite the plants, create d disease complexes from one to the other. So if you've got one plant um, that's got some sort of a, a viral infection, the sharpshooter will, will transfer that. Um, lacewing bugs come in, so quite a few. But healthy vines are able to, um, healthy vines are not as susceptible to insects. So you need to keep your vines healthy and they will be able, to, just like your, your garden too. Um, also beneficial, so we try and um, really keep any sort of ladybugs in there or um, we have good luck up here with uh, Prenamantis. So I wish we could say, yeah, birds and bugs and all that, but it's farming. You're oh, going to get yeah. that. So you mentioned um, fermenting uh, white wine once, red wine twice, but you didn't say how long. Like, 
what is the typical fermentation period? Um, so white wines we ferment nice and cold because we want to retain aromatics, and because they're colder, the, the yeast are not as active. So it might be three weeks, three weeks to a month. Okay. Red wines, we will actually want them to ferment a little bit warmer because they're on the skins. The warmer the ferment helps extract some of those colors. So that might be seven to ten days. So reds go quite a bit quicker. Much longer. Um, so that's just the fermentation. That's where we go from 25% sugar to wine. But that's also a lot of fuel. So think of that big corner of the that orange 25% um, a big piece of the pie. All of that gets converted into alcohol. So that's a lot of energy. A lot of CO2 comes off, a lot of warmth from that. So that's why we have to do punch down to make sure our red ferments don't get too warm. So, so Michael, when you're doing this, So um, during a fermenting process, particularly with the red wines, you said that it's um, a warmer process. Mm -hmm. Do you ever get any kind of molding from the grapes? And if you do, does it add character to the wine? Mold, <laughs> <laughs> like mold wine? Like, is that what you're, are you like, talking about mold, mold, mold and grapes? Mold like, grapes. Oh, oh, no, um, we don't allow moldy grapes. <laughs> uh, well, truly. Um, so we, we take, um, you guys asked about plants and insects. You didn't ask about fungal pressure, which we have too. Uh, powdery mildew affects grapevines. Um, where powdery mildew really hits us is when temperatures are in that like 85 to 95 degree range and high humidity. But when do we have that? Monsoon rain. So what we've learned to do is we've opened up our canopy and we go through and we pull leaves so we get good airflow throughout the canopy so it dries out. It's when there's a lot of humidity there that we have mold issues. Um, the other thing, we don't want cluster on cluster because that's when uh, there's too much humidity there and we get mold. So we go through and we would drop any of that whenever we see it. And then you also saw there was that sorting table, so the table yeah. going by. Anything like that comes out. Um, the, the rule is if you wouldn't put it in your mouth, it's certainly not going into our fermenter. So if it looks like something you want to eat, let it go by. What day, or do you decide this is the day we're going to do it? We're going to go out and pick, or is there a week, or are you looking at a temperature or blowing weather conditions, et cetera? Uh, all of it. All of it. So a day of the week is the only thing that does not factor, whether it's you know Monday or Saturday. It just doesn't so matter. If we were to volunteer, that could be we get a text at 6 o'clock in the 5.30 in the morning, or we're going out the night before, you know? No, we, we're usually able to plan a few days in advance. Okay. Uh, so we have historical information now, which is great. So of our 13 varieties, we know the, the pick order, because that's just what the varieties are going to give us. The B&J is going to be first, the San Giovese is going to be last, and I can tell you within a five-day window when the Cabernet Sauvignon is probably going to be ready. So outside of that, we need to look at the weather. So I can tell you what week that variety would be, and then it'll come down to a couple days in advance, just to make sure the weather is going to cooperate. Do you uh, add any sugar to the wine as in the process? And if you do, what type of sugar would you use? Uh, we do not. You we do not. not. It would have to be a disaster. Um, I have seen that. Um, I've been making wine now for about uh, well 13 years, um, full time. Um, and I have seen scenarios where the rot starts to come in, the bird damage starts to happen. You know, for some reason, we have to pick it at, say, 20% sugar. So somewhere under optimal. And if that is the case, we can use table sugar. So that's sucrose. But once that sucrose goes into solution, it actually turns into uh, a monosaccharide, so a glucose and a fructose, and we can ferment those. Um, so the, the quick answer is sugar, table sugar. Are you able to compost the residue back into the soil? Yeah, that's what we just started doing this year. Um, and we'd love to do that because the, the pumice, we call it, so we, we press those grapes and you've got all the skins and the, and the stems left over. It's all organic material uh, and it's high sugar. So that's kind of like gold for those that compost. What we can do is we can just spread it right out into the vineyard. Um, the challenge we have is this is during the period when it's harvest and we are not looking for extra projects. So what, what we have come to do here at the wine center is we, off, we have offered that to different farmers. So I had a pig farmer take most of it last year. I want to 
try and keep them and spread it back out because I think it'll help acidulate our soil too. So that's our plan is to reuse it. When our uh, when it is extremely frosty and extremely cold for a certain period of time, do you use heaters in the vineyards? We do not. We do not. We don't have as bad of a frost threat where we're at. So we have an east facing vineyard, which is great, and we've got a slope. The slope helps the air movement. But because we're on the west side of the valley and it's east facing, that means we get morning sunshine quite a bit. As soon as the sun comes right over that ridge, mm -hmm. the Empire College Vineyard's going to get the light. We probably get it a good 10 minutes before the people at the bottom of the valley floor. Also, where it's the coldest here is the valley floor. So everybody loves being down by the by the river um, because it's beautiful and there's water down there, but that's also where they have huge pest problems. Anything with four legs is going to try and get into your vineyard, but they have terrible frost issues. So we do okay. Uh, what we hope for is to keep the air moving. Um, I was actually surprised seeing how much damage we had last year because the temperature only got to 30. And I know that's two degrees under freezing, but if uh, the humidity is low, so there's not water molecules there to freeze, and the air keeps moving, we can handle 30. You know, if you get to 27, 26, you know, forget about it, it's going to fry. But um, we've been lucky because of the location of our vineyard. I'm a little ignorant about all of the vineyards, but years ago, I guess World War II, after World War II, the United States donated a lot of different vines in order to replenish the European market with new vineyards. And then also, so my question is, do we ever, or do you ever introduce any of the Chilean vines into into Northern North America, or is that just not done at all? So any sort of plant North material, yeah. any plant material has to go through quarantine, and that's very important. Um, you don't want disease coming in. Um, there are, all the Chilean varietals are, maybe not all of them, the, the big ones are all available here. It's a matter of needing a grower to choose to plant them. Um, I bet they would do well. The list of wine grapes that can grow well in Arizona is long. We've got the right dry climate, we've got the right you know, uh, altitude, all those sorts of things. So we could ripen Carignan, no problem. Uh, Carmen here, we could ripen you know, whatever else it is, name it. But um, somebody's got to be the pioneer to plant it. So, thank you. Yeah. So you said that when there's a frost and the first shoot freezes, the second shoot then comes out. Mm -hmm. Is the um, availability of that second shoot or viability? Is it can you use it in your wine? Is it, is it yeah. Or no? Yeah. So there is a full cluster which um, has two shoulders, kind of two lobes to it, and then a kind of a point down to the bottom. Those two shoulders are not present in the second cluster, so that's where the cluster actually is by volume half. So secondary, you can see the difference. Um, but um, you can see visually that's a primary cluster, that's a secondary cluster. So it, uh, but the grape itself will ripen and develop just the same, it's just going to be smaller. Just a real quick one. Yeah. Um, I, I've done wine tours with friends and um, hit all the wineries in the area and Southwest wineries, far and away, the most fun. Because no, you just learn so much. It was yeah. just a hoot. We had a great time. Thank you. Yeah. And it's beautiful up there. Yeah. What effect is climate change having on your wine process? Um, I, I think it's going to have a lot of effect. All, all the effects you would expect. So if we get higher temperatures, we're going to have lower acids. I mean, there's the qualitative decline, I would expect. Um, I would, I'm more worried about maybe the availability of water throughout all of this. Um, yes, as it gets higher, uh, higher temperatures, the vines are going to stress more. But the availability of water, I think, is going to be the big thing to watch. Is your industry competitive, or, or are you all working together to build the tourism industry in Arizona? Would you say you're very competitive, or more in unison? In unison. Now, our, our competition is all of those other places. Yeah. Uh, there's not enough Arizona wine to meet the demand. And People are drinking uh, wine in Arizona, so the uh, Wine America, which is a, a countrywide industry organization, they, they looked at every state's industry. $19 billion of wine economic output 
comes from Arizona. $19 billion. Now that is everybody's job, every, you know, all the sale of alcohol, all the taxes, all of that. Well, they're not drinking Arizona wine. So we've got one of the best things Arizona wine has for is we've got some great big population centers. We've got Phoenix down there, we've got Tucson, we've got a million people coming up to Sedona, we've got people going up to Jerome and to the Grand Canyon. So there's people coming up here. We just need to get them converted over to thinking about Arizona wine. And they're not, they're getting there. It's a lot better than it was 10 years ago, but um, there's no reason to compete with one another because there's room. <laughs> there, there's still room to get customers. Have you ever tried making ice wine? Uh, no. <laughs> um, so they actually, with ice wine, they leave the, the grapes on, uh, on the vine until it freezes, and then when they press it, the water component, so you remember, think back to that pie where there's a whole bunch of blue and that orange. Well, the blue is frozen, so when they press it, the ice stays behind in the press, and all you get is real syrupy sugar. That's where they end up with super high sugar, but also you have real low volume. Um, so when we pick our grapes in August, we have almost two months. Think of how long it stays warm past August. I mean, it's almost until Halloween that we still have canopy there. So if we were to leave, let, leave it hang until we had freezing temperatures, it would be ice raisins. You know what I mean? In Canada, they don't even get sweet enough, and so they have to use that, you know, concept of drying the drying the grapes through freezing it. Where we have plenty of photosynthesis, we can get all the sugars we want. I was told that Arizona can't make sweet wine. Is that true? No. <laughs> Uh, it's definitely not a can't make sweet wine. Perhaps um, the style is not, you know, the climate doesn't make a, a wine that is, you know, appropriate for that style. You can make sweet wine out of anything. So it's a matter of leaving residual sugar. Now, in order to create balanced sweet wine, you need enough acid to balance the sugar. So when you pick, you actually might want to pick for acid safe and sugar safe. Remember, as we're making that pick decision, we're looking at both of those pieces. A girlfriend of mine tried to tell me that some wines, cheaper wines, which I have a mix of, um, have sulfides and sulfates added, and those give you a headache afterwards. But the more expensive wines don't have that. Is there any truth that? Um, so, so all wines do have some uh, sulfur compounds. As a matter of fact, yeast naturally create a small amount. Um, now, when it comes to the headache piece, there's a lot to, to that conversation. Asthmatics are um, particularly sensitive to sulfides, uh, more so than, than, than other folks. Um, remember, you're also drinking alcohol, which is a diuretic, so that means you're going to dehydrate. Um, there's also histamines in there, which for some people creates inflammation. So it's not any one component. Um, all I have to say about that is it's a matter of moderation. You know, not too much alcohol, and then you won't have too much sulfide, and you won't have too much dehydration. <laughs> any more questions? Uh, with the uh, contamination that we have in our water, here in the valley, does it have an effect on uh, the drip system or watering the grapes? Um, well, we have high bicarbonates naturally because the soil and uh, the soil structure gives us that. So it does affect our drip emitters. So uh, if you've ever run, even at home, I look at my drip emitters and they're covered in that white stuff. We have that problem. So we have to go through and flush all of our emitters. We're able to open up the end of the line and flush the line and that helps kind of break it loose. We're, we can also add some um, organic acid through there to try and break it up through the drip system. So yeah, that, that's always a problem. But also, as you are creating those, those bicarbonates in your, your emitter, you're also creating it in your topsoil, which is where adding the pumice back can kind of alleviate. You know, you're making your topsoil basic. It's like, well, now we need to add some acid back there to balance, you know, the alkaline water we're putting on our soil. I have one last question. Um, when you're checking for the acid and the pH in grapes, do you just take some grapes off and mm -hmm. they can test it that way? 
Uh, the biggest thing is you need to get a representative sample. So don't just go, go and grab the first pretty looking cluster because when we, when we pick it, we're picking all of it. So you kind of have to take your brain out. Um, sometimes literally close your eyes and grab from here, go to that, you know, up the hill, grab from there, grab from this shade side, sun side, press those all together and then measure that. Anybody else? Well, thank you, Michael, very yeah. much for thank your you. uh, presentation tonight. It was very interesting and informational. Um, so with that, next Sunday at 2.30 will be our fourth and final lecture for the season. I again ask all you participants that if you have any items or any people you've heard or you want to hear me talk about, to email the church and let us know because we're looking for programs for next year already. Thank you, everyone.